So welcome back, everybody. Uh, if you were here this morning, it was good to, to kind of chat with everybody. If it's been a while, then uh, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome to our mini session. My name is Mike Martinez I'm with the Maricopa County School Superintendent's Office. Uh, I work with a group of people where we do a lot of school business um, finance related things. We have a uh, several staff members that all they do is work with School ERP Pro uh, and help out school districts with anything from business processes, uh, in payroll, in finance, every everything that involves a school district, uh, we try and get involved with and we're available to help. So uh, as part of that, we help run the, the Ease User Group. Welcome. Uh, we had a couple of in-person groups uh, earlier this month, so we had we went ahead and uh, decided to do a couple online versions. For those of you that can't make it, uh, we will have this video will be recorded and be posted on our YouTube channel a little bit later, likely tomorrow. Um, for anyone who has missed it or just wanted a refresher of what we're going through today. So what we're going to talk about this afternoon is we're going to talk about the payroll rollover and the steps that you take in, in payroll rollover and uh, how to get started in your new year if you haven't already. Um, for those of you that are new to School ERP Pro, the payroll rollover, what that does is that will take a, uh, a snapshot of everything that you have in payroll right now for this fiscal year. So all your positions, all your employees, all your deductions and things like that. And then it copies that information into your new year, fiscal year 24, so that you can go ahead and start doing anything like um, pay uh, adjustments, position changes, new employees, things like that. So we're going to walk through the process of what is required for the payroll rollover. Um, of course, the prerequisite is that the GL rollover will be done. We talked about that this morning. Um, someone in your office probably has already done that. If not, uh, you'll kind of get stuck, but we'll kind of walk through where to see uh, what what um, sections were actually done. So I'm starting off in fiscal year 23. In the main menu here, I'm going to go into general ledger. And I realize that there are some areas that we're going to go into that you may not have access to. So just make sure you kind of jot these down in case you need to reference uh, them for anyone in your office to go in and if they need to click anything or do anything for you. So in general ledger, under utilities, go to year end processing and then process fiscal year rollover. In this screen, this has all the available items that are used to roll into the next year for you. So the general ledger rollover was done already. There's also the, the payroll rollover, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, but associated with the payroll rollover, there's some other things that go along with it. Um, for payroll HR, there's the update years of experience uh, that's something that you'll wait until October to do it. And the, well, all that does is just you use it to just add one to a year of experience in the employee maintenance record. Uh, there's also the export of leave balances. Uh, if your district uses PARs and you want to roll PARs or um, export open PARs, you can do that in here, as well as things like contracts and evaluations and, of course, position vacancies. So we'll kind of touch a little bit on, on a few of those. But for the payroll rollover, uh, the initial setup is once you're in this screen, you'll go up to actions and go to payroll rollover. And the first thing it will ask you when you come in here is, do you want to review the fiscal year rollover settings before proceeding with doing the payroll rollover? So yes, we're gonna go ahead and click yes, and it will take us to the payroll, um, sorry, the fiscal year rollover settings. In here, there is a tab for payroll settings. So we're gonna click that. And there's some check boxes in here. And this is one of the reasons for districts that we host in our consortium. Uh, this is one of the reasons what uh, we like to require districts to contact us when they want to do the payroll rollover, just so that we can go over these items here and make sure that there's everybody's clear on exactly what these check boxes do. Because having one checked and not knowing exactly what that box does could cause some issues for you later down the line. So we're gonna walk through these here really quick. Uh, the first option here is to remove inactive position funding lines. So if you have positions where you've done funding changes throughout the year, the system will inactivate those old lines and then activate the new lines. So if you change funding like from a grant to MNO or vice versa, um, what this will do is those inactive funding lines, it will actually remove those pay lines from the position when you roll it over. 
in most cases, this is exactly what you want it to do. So I would absolutely, in most cases, leave that box uh, checked in there. So it clean, helps clean up all those old funding lines off your positions. The second option is to remove positions for terminated employees. So this one does a little bit more than what may happen, what you may think happens at first glance. So not only if you have positions that are tied to employees that no longer work at your district, when they left, they went on to greener pastures or, or whatnot. Um, what this option does when you have it selected is it not only vacates the employee from that position, it actually deletes the position itself. So if you have someone who's maybe in a teaching position and, you, and they've left, but you want to fill that teaching position again in the future, what this will do is it will actually not only remove that position from the employee, but it will delete that position out of your position inventory altogether. In most cases, that is not what we want to happen. We want to maintain that position control and maintain that position control code. So what we'd rather you do is vacate the position and then let that new position roll over in the next year. So our um, general rule of thumb is to leave that box unchecked. That way it gives you a little bit better control over your position inventory and it's not removing positions that you intend to fill later in the future. The other option is uh, to reset uh, subtract from position distribution amount to zero. So in that, uh, in the employee position, there's a little box in there that says um, subtract from position distribution. This is used a lot if you have an employee that's maybe a late start and they're attached to a full year uh, salary schedule and you need to remove um, salary from that position or adjust it down. Or if they're coming back, maybe they went on a leave of absence, you need to adjust that salary down. Um, for the most part, when you start off that new year, you wanna start off fresh. Um, and, and anyone who started maybe whether they're late or they had a leave of absence or things like that, you're, the intent is hopefully they're fully, they're going to start full time on your normal position start date for everyone in your district. So we would typically recommend to go ahead and reset that subtract them from the distribution box down to zero. Uh, that way you have all your positions kind of like a fresh start, and then you can make adjustments along the way if you need to for anyone who starts late or things like that. So I would check that box. And then the last option on here is remove, or one of the last options to remove positions and supplementals with status of closed. So this, like the one above it, actually deletes those positions out of position inventory. And because we like to kind of hold that position control and that position inventory is kind of sacred, right? Uh, we wanna make sure that we are in control and, and we know which items are gonna be deleted. So we would typically unselect that box. Um, again, if you've already created your vacancies though, then go ahead and remove that. Go ahead and check that box. If you've already created the vacant positions in preparation for the next year in 2023, and, you, and then you're going to roll them into the next year, um, go ahead and select that box and it will remove the employee and the old position out. So that that's a, uh, a case where that would happen to work for you. The last option on here is the zero position amounts. So if you have uh, positions and you want to wipe them out for next year, this is typically, typically going to be things like stipends, coaching stipends, uh, performance pay, things like that. You can come in here, choose a position pay. So I'm gonna say 301 base, 301, and I'll do one, two, three stipend. So what this will do is when I roll into the next year, any position that meets these position descriptions that have these pay descriptions, the dollar amount on those position is gonna be set to zero. Now, you could, there's two, two thoughts to this. One, you can go through and you can go in here and zero out all those positions, and that would work. And some districts have an enormous amount of these positions they need to get zeroed out, and some don't. It comes down to it. Um, the other option is just delete all those supplementals anyway. It's super easy to recreate supplemental positions and stipends like that uh, from an Excel spreadsheet and using a, a position template, uh, and just do it that way. It's entirely up to you and whatever your district happens to have in there. There's no wrong way or right way. It, it really does depends on how, what do you have in your position inventory now uh, and how easy is it for you to just zero everything out or just delete and recreate them. It's kind of up to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Now I've already done the payroll rollover. So it's gonna give me a little message here saying it's already been completed. It's one of those things that you can only do once. So uh, make sure that you do it at the right time. At this point, it is now May 31st. If you have not already done the payroll rollover, 
it really is one of those things that I would highly recommend getting it done within the next week uh, here because you want to make sure you get a, a jump on getting everything set up. You have a lot of work ahead of you. There is no reason to wait till all of your employees are done for the year to do the payroll rollover. There isn't even a reason to wait for all your teachers to finish up for the year. Um, just give yourself enough time. Obviously, the, the number of employees that you have is going to feed into how much time you want to give yourself. Um, but there's no reason to wait because a lot of things that you do in one year are going to duplicate into the next year. So uh, it's cool to go ahead and get that done a little bit early. I believe the earliest we had anyone do a payroll rollover this year was December. Does that sound right? Yep. Jill's nodding her head. So we had someone doing it in December. And again, there, there's, a re there's a reason for it. And then there's a reason not for it. It's again, it's whatever fits for your district. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And let me catch up on my notes here. Um, I did post, I'm just kind of going through right now, I'm going through our uh, MCSS fiscal year end guide. It was in that initial Dropbox link. So if you wanted to follow along, uh, we were on page seven. I'm now kind of moving on to page nine. I'm kind of skipping around. So I apologize in advance, but uh, because we the way we split these up, it's just a lot easier to kind of skip around here. So, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and close this fiscal year rollover window just to double check because there's a lot of items in here that hit payroll and hr i'm going to go into the general ledger the configuration and then the general ledger default settings and in the general ledger default settings there is a tab in here called cross year update go ahead and click that in here there's a lot of things in here uh, and what this tab does is it controls if you make a change in one year, does that change copy itself into the next year? Uh, for a lot of big places within the product, things like if you add a new employee, it, the employee automatically gets copied in the next year. If you add a new vendor, the vendor gets automatically copied. If you have a new account string, account string automatically gets copied. Create a new deduction, mostly gets copied. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but there are other smaller areas that may not affect everybody. So just go in here and just double check which areas does your district use and do you have this cross year update selected in here? Uh, if you hit the drop down here, you have three options. You have none next year and prior and next year. Uh, I would recommend using the next year for most of these uh, because what you want to have happen and this again this is in fiscal year 23 so if i use certificates or use area in the pro program to track certificates if i make a change to a certificate in the current year i want to make sure that that change also gets updated in the next year so i'm going to come in here to certificates and i'll make sure it says next year and i'll kind of go through here and i'll do pretty much the similar thing to ever here and if you haven't been in here a while and they've added something new, it comes in as none instead of anything at all, which is why all of these are none right now. So I'm just gonna go through and set these to next year. That way, anything that a lot of the HR people and your payroll people, if they're doing in 23, will automatically get, char to get changed in 24. And once that all set, I'm going to click OK. Now, I typically won't choose next year and prior year because I want all my copies going forward. Anything that happened for me in 22 is just said and done at this point. So I'm just going to copy from 23 to 24. Click OK. Say what I got. All right. I've had it with General Ledger. Let's run over to payroll. So I'm actually going to switch into fiscal year 24. And if anyone has any questions, go ahead and pop those questions in chat. Not only am I kind of watching it, uh, we have several members from our, our team are on the meeting with us today, so they can pop in and answer any questions for you. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's necessarily related to exactly what I'm talking about. We'll try and answer it as best we can. If it's going to come up somewhere during our mini session today, uh, we'll make sure that we kind of walk through and show you what's going on there. So in the new year, Main menu, I'm going to go to payroll. Eventually. There we go. Under payroll, configuration, and I am going to go to payroll default settings. 
All right. So on payroll default settings, I'm just going to go from kind of top to bottom and make sure I have everything in here that I need to have in here. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that I'm on the right pay cycle. If I haven't, we'll talk about pay cycles in a second. So I am going to set this back to pay period one because it's going to default to whatever pay period you were at when you rolled. So I'm going to set it back to payroll one. Hours per day is fine. My salary is offset is the same as it was last year. So I'm going to leave that the same. Um, my salary expense code filter right now, this is pretty basic. So I just have the 6,100 expense code filter. Um, in our example on our guide, we have one for leave payout uh, on there. There's also, you can put in a 6,200 if you want to just do like all sort of fringe benefits type situations. Um, you can put that in there. So if you can have multiple, I've seen like up to four or five in here, depending on if your district is um, doing a lot of those payouts in here. Yes, yes. On on page, we're on page fourteen right now. So, um, it is uh, these offsets are really dependent on whatever your district happened to name. So, if mine is a little different than yours, that's perfectly fine. What you are looking for actually is the um, the object code in the account mask, and just make sure that that is what it needs to be. And it's all accounting stuff in there. So, uh, most of those should already be set, and they've been there since the beginning of time. But um, if you see something in there weird, feel free to take a look at the account code. That will let you know that you're using the right account code. And if you're in your positions and pay and you were ever trying to add an account code and it says that that you can't use that, it's because it's not in here. So in order to use a code in a position, it does need to be in a mask format, which is why it's a 6100. So it'll grab all your 61s, et cetera. Yeah, and it's easy enough to add new uh, salary expense masks in here. You can come in here, hit the drop down. Um, as long as the offset is already defined, you can go ahead and select it in here. So let me see. Do I have another? You might one? have a travel one in there because that's a common one. I don't see it. No. I don't see it. And this is a training database, so we we don't have everything in here. But um, so we're just going to leave that blank and just go with the sixty one hundred for now. Um, kind of scrolling down here, there's not a whole lot to change as far as setting up for the fiscal year. You just want to double check. I mean, your, your salaries expense code is going to be there and, and reset your pay cycle back to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. A couple of you, uh, districts I know have gone in 24, they're going to 10 hour days, four tens. So be aware, you'd obviously change your hours per day here to 10 if that's what your district is going to. Yeah. Um, the other thing in the payroll default settings, if you click on over here, use uh, the time card interface. If your district uses the time card interface, and I'll talk specifically about TCP because I know we have a, a lot of districts that use TCP, um, make sure that after you do the payroll rollover, uh, that the URL is deleted out of their current, or the, I'm sorry, out of the new year until you finish importing all your hours from the prior year. The URL for TCP can only be in one year at a time. Um, I will have this, and Ginger, I, I will have this video up. Uh, it'll definitely be by the end of this week, maybe tomorrow. Just It's just really busy time of year right now. So it'll definitely be by the end of this week and everybody will get an email when the video is done. So if you miss something, don't worry, we got your back. You can come back here and watch this video. Um, it'll be good times for everybody. Uh, but anyway, back to, to TCP can only, the TCP URL can only be in one year at a time. Uh, we found that out the hard way many, many moons ago. So we just want to make sure that if, when you do the payroll rollover, just come in here and delete out the URL. And then after you've done importing and syncing your last hours for your last pay period in fiscal year 23, then you're going to delete it out of 23 and then put it in 24. So um, mm -hmm. that's just the, the one little TCP gotcha that we try and remind everybody about. Are there any questions about the payroll defaults or GL defaults? No, nope, looks like you're good. All right. So the other thing I want to take a look at is I'm going to go into uh, deductions and benefits. And I am on page 16 of the MCSS rollover guide for those of you that are playing the home game. So under deductions and benefits, I'm going to go to deductions and benefits maintenance. And I'm going to check out a couple of my deductions first, because this always seems to catch somebody. And there are, let's see, 
Let's see how many people. 45 people logged on. I could probably guarantee at least one of you are from a district that's had a problem with this in the past. So in deductions and benefits, I'm going to open up our direct deposit deduction. And the first thing I'm going to look for is this little checkbox here. On the right hand side about the middle, there is a little checkbox that says allow sync from prior year. This is one of those deductions that that box should be on. In fact, it's going to be on. It really should be on for a decent part of your deductions anyway. Um, but what this will do is if an employee submits a change for their direct deposit in the current year, in fiscal year 23, you want to make sure that that change on their direct deposit is also copied to 24. It doesn't automatically happen unless that box is checked. So things like tax changes, things like direct deposit changes, account changes, um, little things like that. If that box is not selected, that change will not be copied to the next year. And so what will happen is they'll be fine. You'll finish off your last pay period of fiscal year 23. You'll run your first pay period of fiscal year 24. And if the employee had a direct deposit change, say they closed an account, um, for some reason or another, or they change their account or they change the, the percentage or dollar amount for one of the other direct deposit deductions. Uh, what it will do is when you run that first pay period for fiscal year 24, that money disappears off into the ether. Uh, and then you have to go through the process to work with the bank to try and find out where it was. Uh, if you're lucky, it got returned to you and you can at least, you know, we can find a way to get the employee the money, but make sure that box is checked, make sure it syncs with the prior year. Uh, that way, those important types of changes are always copied forward. The other thing I want to check on here, let me go ahead and cancel out of here, is on your Fed tax deduction. I will look for, there is a little checkbox here that says allow tax update. That box should be on for everybody for their federal tax deduction. Um, I, some states that, that have changes in their state taxes, Arizona is different because ours is a flat percentage amount and it's really kind of like the same year after year after year, except for the recent changes. Um, so that, that percentage amount doesn't change. But for the federal tax deduction, make sure the allow tax date option is on and make sure that box is checked. Because what will happen, um, you need to make sure that when the new tax tables come out and they'll come out late, November, early December, uh, you'll need to make sure that you have a way to easily update those tax tables because you don't want to run that first pay period of the new calendar year and not have those tax tables in there or, or not or have the incorrect ones in here. Um, the other thing you want to check is under actions, go to setup. And this is going to be again, this is in the new year. You'll look in here and here's my 2023 numbers, all my exemption amount, all my tax tables. And I actually have them in 24. Let me find another one. There we go. All right. If you look in the 2024, there is nothing in here because the 2024 tables aren't out yet. So what you need to do is you actually need to come in here and you have to copy your 2023 tax tables into 2024 just to make sure that you have something in here. Um, unfortunately, if you we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we have run that process to compute all year on all your pay periods. Um, if you don't have a tax table in there, what it will do is it will actually error out. Uh, and by the time you actually get to that tax table, or you want to make sure that that whole process runs through every time you run that compute selected periods um, to make sure that your encumbrances are correct. And if you don't have them correct, it just blows up and bombs out. And so your GL is now off because your tax tables are missing. So the easy workaround for that, actions, copy. Oh, I need to change this 2023. So I'm gonna select one of my 2023 rates. I'll go to actions, copy, single higher rate. I don't know why this doesn't default to the correct one. I mean, they kind of hard coded in there. It'd also be nice if they gave you the option to copy all of them at the same time. It absolutely would be nice. <laughs> Absolutely. So what I have to do is I will make sure that I have the right marital status. And then I'll do from the old year or current year to the new year. Just click OK. And so now that when I'm in 2024, I now have tax rates in here. And so I will have to do this. And by I, I mean you all come in <laughs> here 
and make sure that we do all the copies from 2023 to 24. Mary joint. And Mary Married standard. Yep. It's the new. Yep. And just make sure all those are copied. Um, will it hurt anything right now? Not for you. Uh, it will hurt your, uh, if the compute all year doesn't work correctly, once you get past January, um, it doesn't encumber correctly or pre-encumber correctly uh, for those benefits and stuff because it crashes when it tries to calculate the federal tax rates for people. So um, even though that, even though it's not an employer side expense, the system kind of throws up every time you try and run it and it's not there. So make sure you copy all of those in there and go ahead and click OK. And click OK. Anything else? What am I? Is that it for deduction? That was the main stuff, right, Jill? Yep. Make sure you update your ASRS, all those fancy little things for ah, July yes, 1st. Yes. Yep. Let's double check the ASRS really quick. So I'm going to go into certified. Everyone should be using deduction lines by this point. Yes. I'm just going to mm -hmm. assume you're all nodding your head enthusiastically. Uh, in ASRS to edit the deduction line, you're just going to come in here to this deduction line. You will put in the new percentage in here. Remember, this is for anything paid in the new year. So you'll, you can do this already in FY24. You'll just come in here and change this percentage. Click OK. Click OK. And, this, and then key, update. for anything with a deduction line, after you change it, you're going to come in here, you're going to highlight the deduction, go up to actions and choose update employee deduction lines. So that'll make sure that it pushes out that new ASRS rate to change to everybody. Um, make sure you do that for ASRS. Uh, if you made any changes to um, any, any of your insurance deductions, if you have deduction line changes on there, make sure you update all that um, just to make sure everything is kind of cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And what else? State retirement. Do, 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 do. Nope, that's good. All right. Any questions on deductions so far? We good? Everybody shading your head? All right. Now that you have all that stuff set up and you've kind of rolled, you have the positions and you have your employees, now you get the fun part of actually starting to set up your new fiscal year. And the first thing you get to do with the new fiscal year is you actually get to set up when do your employees get paid? What kind of pay cycles do you have set up and how do you configure those? So I'm going to go into payroll under configuration and then to calendars. And the first thing I'm going to touch is my pay cycle. And there are two schools of thought for this. And Jill and I literally argue about them every single year. Um, you can either set up a new pay cycle for the new year or edit your existing pay cycle for the new year. And there's pros and cons for each of them. And Jill and I have slightly differing schools of thought sometimes. So we'll kind of like, we'll, we'll tease each other about it for a little bit. Um, but in the end, if you talk, if you're working with her at your district, she's going to tell you to do it one way. If you're working with me, I will tell you to do it another way. And there's not necessarily a wrong way to do it. Um, it's just really kind of personal preference. So we'll kind of walk through how to do them both. So if you go into the pay cycle, and I'm just going to open up my bi-weekly pay cycle, and this one's already done, so we kind of cheated here. Um, in our pay cycle, we want to make sure everything is set up, all the bank accounts are set up. Um, to update an existing pay cycle to the new year, what you have to do is you'll go to Actions, and you'll go Update Pay Periods with Next Year's Dates. This will add one year to the existing pay period dates. Do you wish to continue? Yes. Okay, so this is the basics on how a pay cycle is set up. So you kind of have to work backwards when you set these up. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. So first of all, you need to determine what is, someone's already given you a list of what your pay periods are gonna be. It, it's unfortunately, for most people, it's gonna be out of the control because your board has at some point, um, already made the decree. This is when we're getting paid. These are the work calendars for the new year, and that's fine. So we're just setting everything up to mimic whatever was authorized. So the first pay date, we want to make sure we set up the first pay date. So in this case, uh, it is set up on the third Friday in July. 
And then what is the pay period for that particular pay date? So if it's the 19th, I'm going to say my pay period end date is on the 12th, meaning it's going to go, my full pay period is going to go all the way back to, I'm in July 24. Yes, yes. Because I've already done this. So I'm just kind of faking it out here. So you just, just, you know, it just kind of, just kind of go with me here. Um, the dates are, I've already updated this pay cycle. So that's why it looks a little bit weird. So if I was going, if my pay date was on the 19th and I went a week back, my pay date would end, my pay period end date would be on the 12th. And so my pay period beginning would be on June 30th. 30th? Mm -hmm. 30 I'm days. Go back in June. one day, 29th, right? Let me get You're going to start on a Saturday. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So what is the what is that last Saturday in June? In this one, it'll be 29. Because Sunday would be the 30th. You're in 24. Right. Right. Oh, great. Right. Because right. so. I'm looking at the word dates. Okay. Yep. Your weird dates. I'm going to go back one date here. Yep. All right. So I'm going to change. Whoops. I changed the wrong thing. Dang it. You did. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So in this... I'm actually going to backdate it. And it's just asking for the first period start date. And let me try and explain this to um, what you are doing is you are lying to the system. <laughs> you are, you are lying to the system to get it to generate in correct proportions for the remainder of the year. So does your first pay period actually start on 629? No, obviously not. We're going to change that once it's done. But we want to make sure that when it generates the rest of the pay cycles for the remainder of the year, it's generating it on the right day. Um, with the right date, I can always go back and mimic and, and, and kind of fudge the dates, the begin dates, so that everything works out for me. Um, so I'm just kind of faking it out here. So I'm doing this 6, 9, 629 to 24 biweekly, uh, first day in the pay period. So I'm going to click OK. And what it's going to do is it's going to update all the dates in my pay periods or in my pay cycle to match what I had just asked for. So the first thing I do, obviously, this start date is 629 that's not correct so i'm going to go in here and i can manually change this to 71 click okay and then i'll just kind of scroll through here this is going to be part of your i'm looking through this at the beginning of the year to make sure everything's right um, i'll also look at the pay period end dates on the last pay period let me see um, what i can do here if i need to change one of my dates um, depending on where this date and i don't have a calendar in front of me uh, I may have to change this last pay period end date. Maybe it's over a weekend, um, or maybe I change this back to 6.30 and I have this pay period 27 with two days on it. Uh, either one works, depends on what you have. I will also go through all the pay dates here to see if anything falls on a holiday. So if it falls on a holiday, if I make need to make any adjustments uh, to ensure that the bank transactions happen on time, Obviously, if, if you have a holiday and you have uh, maybe you know Thanksgiving or obviously, you know everyone knows when Thanksgiving is or um, one of those Veterans Day or um, even Fourth of July right there. Yeah, Fourth of July, Fourth depending of July. on when things happen, you may want to change your pay date to kind of um, make sure that it hits the bank on the day you intended if it's a bank holiday. Uh, also, if you need to add any other off cycles in here, we have a 24.1 for uh, that we issue our balance of contract payments on or our lump sum payments on. Uh, we added that in here, so we make sure that we can update that. And then that's it. It is verifying all the beginning dates of the year. So I'm going to go and click OK. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and the question is, as we pay on a Tuesday, are we going back to Friday? So no, this is just an example and that was just an update on here. So let me go ahead and create a new pay cycle based off a Tuesday pay date. And just going to create my own pay cycle here. Bi-weekly, select my bank account, actions, and I'm going to generate pay periods. And I'm going to do the kind of the same thing here. So looking at my calendar that I have on the side here. And now you can look at 23. <laughs> now I can look at 23. So 
depending on where I am. So I'm going to say that my first payday in July for this year is going to be July 18th, which is a Tuesday. So I'm going to say this July 18th. So if my pay date is July 18th, that means my pay period end date, I'm gonna say is July 9th. So I have the week of the 10th to actually process my payroll, pays on the 18th. So I'm gonna say July 9th through, what is this Sunday here? It would start Monday and end Sunday. So you'd start it on the 26th because you just had it end on a Sunday, yeah. right? Again, so we're lying to the system. So we tell them the system that we're starting on June 26th. Uh, and then it's going to go through that July 10th and then pays on, or sorry, 9th. July 9th and then pays on the 18th. And we'll set it up bi-weekly. And the number of pay periods, I always go big. I will start at, not 285, I will start at 28 because I can always delete a pay period from the end of my pay cycle. I just want to make sure I have enough pay cycles to get me through the end of the year. And then I will make adjustments to the end uh, what, for whatever I need. So I'm going to generate 28 pay periods just in case. I go ahead and click OK. All right generated all my pay periods again. Again, I'm gonna come in here and I will change this to 7-1, which is just another day. We well, disagree about that too. Well, that's because you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and when I get down to the end of my calendar, I see 28 is entirely in July. I do not need that pay period, so I'm gonna delete it. I will change pay period 27 to go from 624 to 630 to get the end of my fiscal year. Click OK. And then I now have a full pay cycle of dates uh, for the fiscal year. And like I said, it's one way has six of one way, half a dozen right. another. As I don't know, whatever the saying goes, do whatever works happen uh, works for you. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer the adding a new one because then I can keep track of which pay cycle is attached to which work calendar, and I know exactly which ones I've updated. Um, for ease of use, Jill's ways might be better because uh, it's just updating everything that's already there. It's fairly clean. You don't have a whole lot of work to do. So like I said, whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the key is to remember that he, the key is to remember at the beginning, regardless of which way you do it, although your fiscal year starts July 1st, for the sake of keeping the calendar to make a cycle of every two weeks, you've got to say it starts in that June date. Yeah, yeah. And if you have any questions, I mean, feel free to call. We'll, we'll happy to kind of walk you through some of that stuff. Like I said, it's really just figuring out the best way to lie to your system. Um, to get the answers that you want out of it. And I'm totally okay for that. All right, so we'll go ahead and close this dialog after update. I saved my pay cycles. And I don't need those notes anymore. Let me close those. They keep getting in my way. All right, so I have my pay cycles. The next thing you'll need to do is start to update your work calendars. So I'm going to go into my work calendars here. And you're going to want to start with, first of all, you, your priority should be on all of your 12-month people. Don't worry about getting out the door and say, oh, I got to have all my work calendars going. I got my teachers come back. Teachers aren't going to be back for a few months for most all of you. So leave those. Those, those can wait. We want to make sure that you get that first payroll in July out the door. Um, everything goes smoothly at that point. Then worry about getting everything else taken care of. So I'm going to start with all my 12-month stuff. So I'm going to start with my 12-month Um Let's, let me start with my hourly 12 month. Those are usually the easiest ones. So I'm going to go to my hourly 12 month. I will go to um, pay periods, select the pay cycle I want. So again, if I update it, I can use this. If I want to use my new one, I can go here. But let me go back here. I'm going to remove all that. Come into Mike's pay cycle. And now I'm going to come back and add them all. So now who's on my pay cycles for the new year? I will make sure I adjust my start date on here to be for the full year because this is my full 12 month calendar. My distribution type is going to be actual. Um, if you're setting up a new calendar or, or if you're looking at the, the work calendar, how it's set up, 
Um, just run through really quick in here. You have your balance start period full versus balance start period actual. The only difference between these, and these are for people that are on salary work agreements. Um, the only difference between these two is the first pay period. So if you have the employees and they're attached to a pay period and they've only worked like three days in that first pay period, if they get a full check after that three days, that is a balanced start period full. If they only get paid three days for that first pay period, then that is a balanced start period actual. And that is the only point where that even comes into play. So for, for example, if your teachers start like on a Tuesday and their first day of actual work, you know, is that following Monday, do you want to pay them the full amount? Uh, or do you want to pay them for only the time work? That's going to be a district decision as to what you guys have decided to do. The same thing happens uh, if you have salary people that are attached to a 12 month calendar. If we've all seen those instances where someone has a, their first pay period is seven one to seven one with a pay date on seven one, do they get a full check or do they get one day worth of check? Uh, that will, that kind of drives what, what that says. Um, and keep in mind, it's not just the start at the beginning of the year. It's even your late starts. So if you have a start period actual, and that's the work calendar, and they start October 7th, that is their start period, and it will be actual or full, whichever you chose. Um, there's the actual calendar. These are all your time card people. So that's the easiest one. Uh, there's the hybrid calendar. If you use that, that is um, if you use a hybrid work calendar, meaning that you can go back and forth between a balanced payment versus a time worked payment. For right. example, uh, you it'll do, do on... the first and last periods actual. Yeah, and everything can, yeah. in the middle balance. Yeah, and you can you could tweak it however it needs to happen. For example, if you went on you know two weeks for winter break, some people worked a couple days, or maybe you pay them actual time worked, or do you just you know pay them actual? It it, it all depends. Um, it gets kind of convoluted there. So if you have any questions or you think a hybrid calendar might work for you, feel free to give us a call. Oh, awesome. We'll try and talk you through it. So I'm gonna leave that to actual and go ahead and click okay. And then I'm, I'm clicking okay just to save what I got so far. Um, I haven't done, right? Yeah, I haven't clicked ready to generate yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and click yes. Oh. I think you wanted to know it says it's updating positions it's we don't not have really a lot. updating anything we don't have all right i'm going to go back into my hourly 12 month and i'm going to go into the calendar tab so now that you've kind of set up the pay cycles and everything now the first thing you need to do is actually set up um when does this calendar work when are the days off that you have when's thanksgiving when's christmas when's spring break when's fall break things like that I'm setting that up relatively easy though. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, well, I kind of did a lot of these already, but we're going to pick a new one. Let's say Labor Day. Give them a holiday. When's Labor Day? September 1st, I think. Fourth, September 4th. First right. Monday. Yeah. First? Monday. Oh, the fourth. Oh, it was the first Monday. Yeah. Okay. So Monday. September 4th. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the fourth. To get the day off, you click on the number on the calendar, so that makes it pretty easy. It'll tell you if there's a date range. Um, so if you're taking a whole week, um, or if it's just a day, you can have a day to day. So the reason, what do we say, Labor Day? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna say, uh, let's say it's a paid day off. And you can have any one of these three options on here. So if it's a weekend, um, most of these, you're not gonna have that option to really worry about it. So you just kind of leave that. Um, if it's a paid day off, which means it includes on the work calendar as a paid day uh, going forward. So there's really nothing special you need to do. You can leave that. Um, there's also the option to force someone to take leave, which means they will only get paid if they take leave for that day. Um, I've seen some districts use that, some don't. It's entirely up to you. Um, I'm actually going to take off paid day right there for this and click OK. And you see it changes this to red in the calendar. It also puts it down here in this list that it is a day off. Uh, that's and that's all you need to do. And what you will have to do is take your 12 month calendar, go through, put all your days off in there. 
So put your spring break in there, put your winter break in there, Thanksgiving, all those days that all of your employees have off, you do that for your 12 month calendar. And something that we noticed working with you 410s, you people that are now going to 410s, you can't say that Friday is a weekend because it doesn't understand that and it won't calculate right. You just make it a red day off like Mike did when he pulled up Labor Day. He didn't say it was a weekend, nor did he say it was a paid day off. He just said, OK, it is now red and won't be counted as a paid day. So for your Fridays, you know. Monday through Thursday, people, you do need to do that to get it to turn red. Don't try and make it a weekend because um, Tyler updated and knows that weekends are Saturdays and Sundays and won't grab that Friday. It won't calculate right. Okay. Once you've put in all the days that you need in here, go and click OK. And it's going to do its little thing again. It's going it's to pretend. One thing, oh, I forgot to tell everybody. One thing that you want to do is on your work calendar, there is a little box here that says ready to generate. That is the absolute last thing that you do with these positions. Um, you do not want to check that box until you've completed all of your work calendar setup, because once you check that box, it will actually go to start updating those positions and updating the salary and the distribution for that. And that takes a long time to do. So it's easier to just wait till the very end, wait till you've done all your updating before you clicked ready to generate. Now that I've done all my days off though, so I am gonna take another calendar. I'll just highlight my 12 month exempt. I'll go to actions and I will apply a calendar template. And let me show you what this does. So I'm gonna take my, where's my hourly 12 month? What this will do is all those days off that I put in my hourly 12 month, I'm going to copy it to my 12 month exempt. And it's going to tell me this will all the selected calendars will have their non work days removed and replaced with the non weekend non work days from hourly 12 month. So it's going to take all the work that I put in that hourly 12 month and copy those days off into my 12 month exempt. So which is exactly what I want. And I will go here and I will kind of go through all of these calendars to make sure that I've copied all those days off. And if there's any that need some fine tuning or tweaking, maybe you have some late starts or things like that, I can always go in and update those later or, or manually change those later. Um, but all the big days off at your district, most everybody is gonna have those. So just start with one and then just copy that template to everybody. That's the easy way to do it. Once you're all set and you have everything done, you go to actions and I'm sorry, and you're ready to generate. And I'm actually going to click ready to generate here. I don't think there's a whole lot to worry about. I'm going to click OK. And yes, it's going to update all the positions tied to this particular work calendar. And this is a small training database. So this is kind of going, this will kind of go really fast, relatively fast anyway. Um, for your district, chances are you have more than 10 employees tied to a particular work calendar. So this could take a decent amount of time. So just make sure you, you budget enough time to do this. This, for the big ones, this is a click and then go to lunch type thing. Or if you have a really big one is a click and then go home for the day and hopefully come back tomorrow and it's all done. The other thing you need to do, highlight the calendar, you go up to actions and update positions. It used to be that everything was all just kind of wrapped into one. Now Tyler recommends not only do you do it and generate, but you're gonna come in here to actions and do update positions. And this will make sure this will uh, update all the start and end dates on all those positions based off what you said in the work calendar. And before you've gone and generated, make sure you're looking at your grid here that your work days equal what their contracts and work agreements say. Your teachers were supposed to work, you know, 184 days that it says 184. Your 12 month of working 242 that it says 242. Yeah, this is your magic number that you want to try and tie to on the number of work days here. So um, just make sure whatever whatever your work calendar is set up for matches the contracts that you guys generated a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. 
Any questions on some of that work calendar setup? I know it's kind of a simplified version of it. So if you do, don't, don't worry. If you do have questions, um, it does take a while to set some of these up. So make sure you get started uh, and leave yourself enough time. Again, concentrate on your 12 month ones, get those squared away, get those, those first pay period, first, you know, two, three pay periods taken care of. Uh, and then you can worry about your teacher stuff a little bit later. All right. I do want to take a look at one of the teacher work calendars here um, because we had I had a couple of questions come in about um, setting up some of the teacher work calendars. So I'm just going to go ahead and actually set this up. So I'm going to go deselect all and I'm change this to my pay cycle. I'll select all and then I am going to remove the first couple. Say when are my teachers going to come back? Let's say they come back. Eight, here. seven. Yeah. Yeah. And then for me, they're going to end right here on 24. Let's say, yeah, let's say right here on 24. Then I'll change this. I guess I haven't done this in a while, right? August 7th. To All right, and I have my teacher set up as balanced start period full, so they will get a full pay period. Uh, my ending pay period, I do not have a separate balance of contract pay period set up for this pay calendar. You could set that up. Um, I just chose not to do it. I'm just going to bundle that in with pay period 24 here. My start pay period is going to be pay period 4. And my lump sum is going to be pay period 24. The number of pay periods on here, um, for those of you that haven't set this up, so you have a teacher that maybe works, you know, 20 pay periods out of the, out of your pay cycle. If you're doing that balance of contract where you give them that big balloon payment at the end, the number of pay periods that you have in this lump sum pay period field will define how many paychecks worth of money they're going to get in this one paycheck. So for example, on pay period 24, whoever is attached to this work calendar is going to get four paychecks worth of money. So if you normally get $2,000 a paycheck, you get that multiplied by four. So you're going to get uh, what 16 or not 16. Eight. <laughs> That's good. Pay me. Right, right. So you'll get $8,000 on this paycheck. And here's the nice thing about it. Because of the way the work calendar is set up and the system calculates it, when things like taxes come out, it calculates it based off four different paychecks of $2,000 instead of a one $8,000 paycheck. So um, that really kind of figures in key uh, in here when you're trying to set that up. So whether you have uh, four is pretty common. I've seen five in there or something like that. I haven't seen a whole lot that goes much bigger than that. Um, but that's yeah. how it determines uh, how many paychecks you get on that last loon. Also determines how many paychecks you split it up when it determines your tax rate for the fiscal, for the for that last pay period. And keep in mind that, like Mike said, it, it it'll tax it as if it's four checks. So if you have a flat dollar deduction, like let's say they have a voluntary deduction that goes into you know a voluntary deduction for their medical and it's a flat, and a medical is not a good one to use. It would be more of your voluntaries. It will take it out four times, like a TSA deduction. If I had $100 a paycheck, well, this is a four in one. It's going to take 400 unless I tell it something different. And how do you tell it something different? I was hoping, <laughs> go show them. <laughs> <laughs> That's in your pay like uh, your deduction. Oh, lump sum. Yeah, okay. It doesn't like my uh, off or my lump sum paper. That's fine. I'm just going to cancel out of there. So let's go back to deductions really quick. And since we touched on it, we might as well talk about it. So let's say let's find oh garnishments. Yeah. No garnishments, garnishments a bad example. Let's not do garnishments. Let's do um, medical insurance. Yeah, because they don't have a TSA. So sure. All right. So in your insurance or in your deductions, there is a little box here that says one time lump sum. So if you have that box checked and it's a pay period, that lump sum pay period, if that box is checked, that deduction is only going to come out once for that pay period. So if my, my um, balance of contract was paid on 24.1, 
and I'm running 24.1 and this is checked, it means my insurance deduction is only going to come out one time. If that box is turned off, it will come out once for each of those, um, each of the pay periods you've defined to come out of that lump sum. So like we had four on there, it's going to come out four different times. Uh, if that is the intended, if that is the intent of this deduction, then yes, that need to happen in, in you know a case like um, our most most garnishment deduction, like a, like a writ of garnishment. You want that to come out every single time on that lump sum pay period. Or, so if it's four times, it needs to come out four times as much, or, or try to come out four times. Uh, if it's something like child support, you want to make sure it's a one time lump sum, and it only comes out once on that pay period instead of the four times. So it really depends on the deduction. Um, if you have a right. question as to whether, if you have a specific question, whether or not you need to have that turned on for deduction, uh, make sure that you ask and we'd be, we'd be happy to help you there. What does include zero pay mean? Where is that at? Oh, zero pay deduction. So if you have, um, you can set up a zero pay deduction is, or sorry, it's not a zero pay deduction. What it is, it's a zero pay position. So let me give you an example. Say you have an employee um, where you are paying something on the employee's behalf, even though they are not currently earning money for you. For example, maybe you have someone that's on a leave of absence, or maybe you have someone that's on admin leave, or you have maybe a retiree that you had in the system, and it, it depends on how your district has it worked out, but you still wanna pay your employer side of that insurance um, or if there's a particular deduction that you want to pay on that employee's behalf, then what you would do is you set up a, a supplemental or set up a position um, that is a zero pay position, attach the deduction for it, and then that way that deduction, the employer side of that deduction gets paid even though that employee is not currently getting a paycheck from you. That's what the zero pay is set up for. I, I don't see it set up a whole lot. Yeah, and to be honest, if, if I had to set one up today, it would take me a little bit because I'd have to, to double check to make sure I've had everything right. But that is the intent of what that checkbox is for. Um, it's relatively rare. Uh, it happens every once in a while, though. So if, if that's that's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, anything else on the deductions or um the work calendar, work calendar space setup. cycle i think we're good there i'm gonna go ahead and cancel out there just to make sure that we kind of covered everything i do want to take a look at your leave plans so leave plan under leave plan maintenance because you you if you set up especially if you set up a new pay, pay cycle you need to make sure that you are accruing uh on all the correct pay um pay periods now so let's go into leave plan maintenance and let's just say our we're going to do our just let's do a vacation actually looking at my vacation i will go to the accrual pay periods or alternate play pans uh, pay, yeah. <laughs> yes um what i will have to do is it will actually show me all my pay cycles in here it's kind of a pain in the butt to be honest with you um, but it shows you all the pay cycles in here so if i wanted to use my new mike's pay cycle in here i'm going to deselect all come down here to mike's pay cycle filter by selection select all so that way it accrues on all of my new pay cycle so you want to make sure that you update, um, come in here and update which pay periods you actually accrue on for all of your pay plan, uh, your pay plans, your leave plans. God dang it. It's been a long day. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I, I swear it's just Powerade in this, this drink. All right. Um, make sure your accruals are set up in here. Uh, if you are adjusting an existing pay cycle you should be okay but again just double check everything it's easier to double check than it is to go through and manually try and accrue all your leave for an employee uh, for all your employees if you happen to miss the pay uh, miss a pay period worth of accrual so just double check that and i think that's it is there anything else i may be forgetting jill annette no no Jeff, i'm thinking anybody? Anyway. I mean, that's a, it's a crash course version, but yes, that's it. That's kind of what yes. you want to do. 
So I, I, I will apologize. I, we try and keep these mini sessions to one hour. Um, when we did their full payroll year end one, I think I think we were at Cartwright for three hours. And we kind of went into a little more in depth into one of the things. But this is like like Jill said, this is a crash course. Um, th if you have questions about what certain things mean or, or, or how certain things work, uh, feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. Uh, you can contact us uh, by reaching out to we have a group inbox. Uh, for our financial system support, it is fss at maricopa.gov. Uh, I will go ahead and put that in the chat box in case anyone wants to email us. And we will be happy to help you. It doesn't matter if you are in our consortium or it really doesn't even matter if you're in our state. If you have a question and, and we can help you out, then we will try and help you out to the best of our ability. Um, most of these we deal with on a day-to-day on -day basis. Every once in a while, we get a weird one, like someone asking, what's the zero pay do? Like I said, um, if it's been a while, then we may take a second to, to double check to see uh, how certain things work because it's one of those, School ERP Pro is one of those programs that even though you think you know something, the functionality or how that thing works may have changed over the past couple of years. And if I haven't been in there in, in, on a consistent day-to-day -day basis, uh, I may forget, so I'll I'll try and um, try and get that uh, get the right answer for you. So, if there's no other questions, it has been an hour, uh, almost to the minute. So again, thanks for joining us today. I certainly appreciate uh, everybody jumping online. I think there was ended up with a little over forty of you. So thanks again. Um, we'll have the video for this up on the YouTube's in a couple days here. So make sure that if you are, were on our email list and you got the email about this, um, we will shoot out the link for that so you can kind of go back over it. Again. All our documentation is in the Dropbox link. So help yourself. Go ahead and nothing is too good to not steal. So go ahead, take it back to your office, print it out, um, put copies of it in the restroom at work. That way everybody doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have an excuse to not have seen it. Um, but have a great day, everybody. And enjoy, enjoy your, God, it's only Wednesday. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of the week. Uh, if you have any questions, again, always feel free to, uh, reach out to us. We'll be happy to help. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.